Good morning, everyone. My name is Amina Chitembo, and I'm a PhD student at the Montfort University. My research is looking at migrant women's career progression into leadership positions, as well as entrepreneurship. I'm presenting this integrative review paper to you on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Ngosa Kambashi, who is also a PhD student at the Montfort University, and she's looking into psychology. Dr. Sean Colladay, who is an associate professor and reader in entrepreneurship and international development. And then Dr. Amarachi Amalgo, who is a senior lecturer in human resources and organizational behavior. And together we're working on this integrative paper, which uh, came out of part of the research that I am doing and part of the research that Ngosa Kambashi is doing. So with this review, I'm going to present to you the background and context, and then um, the review aims and the research questions. We're going to look at the theoretical underpinning and also the literature. Then we look at the methodology and discussion, and finally, we're going to look at some of the recommendations that we have made. Before I go any further, let me just uh, explain that on the title, you may have seen that we're looking at UK-based studies. However, as we went on with this review and as the paper has moved on quite a lot, we are now expand the review within the UK that were not in our papers that we're talking about this particular audience that we are interested in. The contribution of Black African migrant women is seldom heard and under-researched. Usually when you hear about migrants, you hear about migrants in a different context and not so much within the organization and within higher levels of the organization. Developed countries are always looking for highly skilled people to come and fill up the shortages in the key services and to better the economy. Highly skilled people who are in the third world countries are also looking for better opportunities for themselves. They have invested in their education, in their own, uh, in, their, in their cells, and they want to make a better life for themselves and also for their families that they leave. So when they see the invitations from the developed countries, they take them up and they come and to a country like the UK, the US and other uh, developed countries. What makes them though, in the countries that they join is very uncertain and it varies greatly. There isn't a lot of research that looks at the trajectories of these migrant journeys. So this review is driven by the need to highlight the contribution of migrant, Black African migrant women especially, because this is one of the groups that's really affected not being very salient as in leadership positions and also their contribution being known. So in this study, we're looking at long-term international Black African migrant women. The interest in this particular community will become very clear very soon. Let's go into some facts. In 2019, 272 million people were living in a country other than their country of birth. And out of those, 82 million were in Europe. 74% of all international migrants were between the age of 20 and 64, so working age. Migrants sent approximately 600 billion in terms of revenue to their home countries. This does not include the non-official figures. For example, if I am traveling to my country, I will carry some money to go and give to my relatives to go and help out back home. That is not accounted for. These are official routes that, uh, that have been accounted for. Migrant women are less than migrant men within the um, developing world, but they tend to send more money than the, the men, while they have, uh, they send more money and they're lower percentage, they also face, unfortunately, the penalties for their high, high qualifications. So for them to be able to travel to 
the developing world. There are certain qualifications that are needed by the countries where they're going to, for them to be able to fill up the jobs that they are going to, to be in. And most of these jobs will be in public sector organizations or they'll be in areas where the women are most needed, where the country needs uh, people most. But once they get into the organizations, research has shown that they tend to be found in lower paid jobs. So the aim of the, uh, of the review is to examine the available literature just to develop a snapshot of the current research on this subject. So some keywords that we're looking at are highly skilled, highly qualified migrants. And by the way, highly skilled and my highly qualified I deliberately separate the two because somebody can be highly skilled and not highly qualified and vice versa. We're looking at the human capital and entrepreneurship. And then we're looking at business uh, management and leadership skills. The research questions that we're responding to, what does the literature say in general about the contribution of these migrant women entrepreneurs in their country of birth, where they send a lot of money? Are there any specific studies or programs that support Black African migrant women? Because the context in their UK, for instance, and the context in Africa and Asia are quite different. So we are specifically looking at African countries, Black African women, because we just want to see what is there, what is out there for them and how can they be supported to be able to continue what they're doing. What is the status of the literature? If it is there, what is the status of the literature? And how does it co co contribute to sustainable development goals? We are very key in trying to highlight these contributions as part of the contribution to the Agenda 2030, the UN Agenda 2030 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Theoretical underpinning. In looking at this, study, uh, at this group of women, we look at the, the four within the cracks, they're likely to fall within the cracks because they have they, are, they sit at the intersection of so many identities. Some of those, obviously they are women, they're black women, and then they're highly skilled, highly qualified women who unfortunately have foreign qualifications, which sometimes can be a disadvantage uh, once they arrive. So as they're coming into the country where they're going to live, in this case, the UK, for example, they, are, they know themselves as a highly skilled professional who is wanted in the country where they're going. But once they arrive, they have all these other identities that meet them and the career ladder becomes unattainable and very easily distorted in terms of where they are starting from. They're not starting at the same level as somebody who was born in the country where they're going to live. And also, they have other issues that they have to contend with. Some of them come with families, some of them leave their families back home, so they have to continue supporting them. They have workplace conditions in terms of understanding what happens in the workplace and any of the other politics that are related to that. Being a first generation migrant, the rules of the country where they are and the, the help that is there, they do not understand that. They have to still continue surviving. So some of them, end up leaving the job once they can be able to, because it doesn't pay them enough to be able to carry on um, this support, or they end up taking on an entrepreneurial role as to supplement their, their pay. That is the area where we are looking at. Uh, intersectionality focuses on the might, multiple identities and multiple power relations and influences that society as well as individuals experience in day-to-day -day life. These women do not easily fit in any of or any one of these categories. They fit in a lot of them. So it's very easy for them to be obscure and not be seen for the struggles that they face. Aika talks about the ideal worker who's characterized by rational, strong leadership and commitment to work. And that can be very difficult for them because they have so many things that they are juggling. The inequality regimes that they find themselves in because of the interrelated um, practices, that's very key as well. So together with the um, intersectionality, 
ECHO's gender uh, ideal worker theory, we look at this study within those lenses just to help us understand in terms of placement. In terms of education and qualifications, the human capital investment that they have plays an important role in terms of the knowledge, the skills, the expertise um, in filling those critical shortages in the Western world where they come in. University educated migrants have increased in numbers over the years, but what is not very clear is what are their career outcomes? Where do they end up when they come in? Where do they end up once their uh, limited leave to remain has finished and now they are just treated like any other uh, citizen within the country? Black African women maintain their responsibilities in both host and home countries. They are very key people in also furthering that human capital investments in other people as well. So that contribution is a very important contribution for the developing country as well. Migrant women capital is great, it greatly benefits the host country as well. We are in 2021 right now, and we saw what happened last year with the pandemic. A lot of the key services were being run and were being kept going by the migrant people that are in the country. This is not to say the indigenous people, the people, the people who live in the country don't contribute, but what we're focusing on here is when people move from their own country to go and live in another country, in this case, to come and support the economy of the host countries. There is a business case for more inclusive policies. The shortage in research relating to the career mobility is a key issue. We need to find out first what is being said around them. We looked at the different uh, research methodologies that are there in order for us to find this data. And we went for the integrative literature review because it does help us to summarize um, different types of research. And also it has the potential to build a clearer picture. So our interest is not about the numbers, it's about the context, it's about the local context. These are the processes that, that the integrated literature review follows. And I'm going to just quickly jump through. There's quite a lot of information in the paper that you can follow up and look at. So we looked at the data sources between uh, 2010 and 2020 and peer-reviewed uh, peer, peer -reviewed papers that were in the English language. We had some combination of terms that we used. We looked at various different um, major uh, databases. And then we also looked at the uh, citations from the papers that we found. We did not include conference, uh, conference proceedings and also did not include uh, lit gray, gray literature because research has shown that gray literature at the moment offers very little in terms of additions. And also in the period that we're looking at 2010 to 2020, there is quite a lot of online research. And so we wanted to get a more up-to-date picture. Other relevant searches that we conducted, mainly to support us with the uh, theorization of the area that we're looking at are reports and publications from uh, governments and also from public bodies and international institutions such as the UN, the OECD, and also the uh, International Organization for Migrants. We first came up with 880 records when we do, did a scoping search, which was just very broad. We narrowed that down when we reduced it all the way to six papers, which are the ones that we included. We had to take a very pragmatic step to be as strict as we could be into the criteria so that we can paint a picture in a clear and succinct way. These are the six studies that we reviewed and they, the, the, the journals where they were found, as you can see here, there were two from Germany, there was Norway, New Zealand, Australia, and the USA. The studies that we reviewed identified the relationship between migration, ethnicity, gender, entrepreneurship, and the benefits to the receiving economy, but there wasn't much mention in the contribution towards the countries of origin. The availability of uh, government-led skills, financial support for youth and women 
was available in the papers, but there wasn't the information wasn't very clear for somebody, for instance, who is coming in, who is a migrant, who doesn't understand the law of the land. While there's acknowledgement about remittances in official papers, we found that there's a scarcity of research that acknowledges the wealth and contribution of Black African women migrants. Generic business support is available to pan-ethnic communities. By pan-ethnic communities is anyone who's an, who's an ethnic minority, whether they were born in the country, it doesn't specify very much. So, but we would just wanted to narrow down to Black African, and this is the problem. There wasn't much targeted research that was looking into Black Africans. These findings increase the need for more research into these areas. Research has shown that in general, black owned businesses tend to be smaller and they tend to be informal and they don't have the capacity to grow. While black African women and black people in general possess an entrepreneurial mindset, they struggle in terms of how to grow their businesses, understanding the intricacies that are needed to grow a business and also to make it scalable. Most of the times they end up uh, staying unregistered. More investigations into the drivers and barriers to training needs to be looked at for, for or to be able to find the support. Inclusive entrepreneurship policies. This is another area that we felt as a recommendation we should put forward because we know that policies are there that protect migrants in general or ethnic minorities or underrepresented communities. However, the developing nations differ in the context to that of the developed nations. And when you talk about Africans, you talk about people that are coming from the African countries, developing nations, undeveloped or developed nations differ in their policies. So we need to have more policies that are typically tailored to these communities in able to support so that they can be supported in terms of running their businesses, whether those businesses are run in the host country where they live or they are run within their home, home countries. This will then in, reduce the burden on the women to have to be able to, to support. When they're supported, they train people. And when they train people, they employ people. And that will, in turn, help the world economy. Entrepreneur training for migrants should mirror the country where they're living, as well as the developing country that they're coming from. In terms of business leadership and develop, uh, development skills, the intersection of challenges are there. And this was very clear in the papers that we looked at. It was even clear in the other papers that we were reviewing. However, this is even steeper when actually somebody is a Black African because the issues that come with being a Black African go way beyond other ethnic minority communities. The urgency to make those small amounts of money outweighs the need for access to training. If these were made available in a way that fosters them to be able to access at a lower cost, we strongly believe that this would help them a lot in terms of moving forward. Like in any other study, we had limitations, finding the best possible term to define the cohort that we're looking at was one of the key limitations that we had. The lack of consensus in the level of analysis was another issue that we that we faced and that we managed to go around that by, by, by increasing and broadening our range in terms of where we were looking for the studies that were available. The generalizability, we were not expecting this to be a big study because we know that we are digging into a community that is probably represented in the wider literature, but not very much at the level out of uh, context that we were looking at. So this study is very contextual and it's aimed at helping understand this group of women, the Black African migrant women. It is contextual to Black African migrant women entrepreneurs and their contribution. However, some of the issues that we've raised is that would support the need for further research and the need 
for further discourse in these communities and also in the contribution to the Sustainable Development Goals. This review has offered a small snapshot of the topic that goes across disciplines. It is our hope that we have raised enough interest, we have raised enough need for further and concerted efforts and actions in investigating what else can be done with this community and also to start raising the profile of this community. So thank you very much. I hope this has gone some way in raising your interest. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or any other of my colleagues. And we're all at Demonfort University and it's very easy to find us. Thank you.